This technicality episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Hey guys, I'm here, let's get technical. I'm 16 years old, and even though I was born years after Seinfeld ended, I still love watching episodes to this day, just like how my parents loved watching episodes when they first aired. There's something about Seinfeld that transcends generations and makes it still incredibly astute and enjoyable. However, while it does transcend time, it doesn't transcend geography. It turns out Seinfeld is actually one of the hardest shows to translate into another language. Despite having a massive fan base in America, with its series finale being the sixth most watched television event of all time, boasting somewhere between 76 and 108 million viewers, and despite the usual success of American sitcoms in other countries, it struggled to find a mainstream audience all over Europe. A matter of fact, the only place besides America where it's gained some traction is in Latin America. Why? Why is Seinfeld so uniquely hard to translate? There are two reasons, but let's start by learning more about how Jerry Seinfeld writes a joke. You wanna know why people laugh at that? Cause it's the Truth. No, it's not. Funny is funny. Funny has a certain life to it, a certain magic to it. If you only needed truth, people just read the paper and howl. Jerry doesn't believe something is funny just because it's true, as seen in that clip from Jerry's show Comedians and Cars Getting Coffee. Yes, episodes of Seinfeld are true and relatable to an American audience, we'll get back to that later, but Seinfeld's relatability doesn't make the show great solely on its own. There are many other factors that make up funny. So what is that magic? To find out, let's look at a couple clips from this interview Jerry did with the New York Times on his joke writing process. We just stared at it like an alien spacecraft and we were like chimps in the dirt playing with sticks. What makes that joke is you got chimps, dirt, playing, and sticks. In seven words, four of them are funny. Chimps? Chimps are funny. <laughs> so now I'm looking for the connective tissue that gives me that really tight, smooth link. And if it's too long, if it's just a split second too long, you will shave letters off of words. You count syllables, you know, to get it just, it's more like songwriting. One of those factors that makes up funny, arguably one of the most important factors when it comes to Seinfeld, is how much of the humor relies on the nature of English, how words are said, and the stigma around those words. This is the first problem with translating Seinfeld, humor based in words. Word based humor makes up for a large chunk of Seinfeld. For example, take this scene from the season three episode, The Boyfriend. She's wondering when we're gonna come over and see the baby. Oh, see the baby, again with the baby. Who are they? Oh, this guy used to live in the building. They keep calling us to see the baby. You gotta see the baby. When are you gonna see the baby? Can't they just send us a tape? The phrase, you've got to see the baby, isn't inherently funny, but the way Jerry says it, the cadence, the voice, the inflections, etc., makes it so. You've got to see the baby. You wanna come with me and see the baby? No. Oh, fasten your seatbelts, we're going to see the baby. Let's compare that to the German version. Leute, ihr müsst das Baby sehen. Wann seht ihr euch mein Baby an? In the German version, the phrase is, Du musst das Baby I, I didn't want to butcher it. Um, Zen, meaning C, is placed at the end of the sentence, and thus given the emphasis. And when the emphasis is on C and not baby, some of the humor is lost. Moreover, as you just saw, many European countries strongly prefer dubbing to subtitles. There are a variety of reasons for this. First, nationalism. Dubbing first arose in Europe in the 1930s, when many countries were under fascist leaders and governments, and they believed that if they heard their language in pop culture, it would validate it and increase country pride. Second, there's a whole industry built around dubbing in various countries now, and third, in some languages, the information per character is smaller than in English, meaning that sub subtitles can't even physically fit on the screen. Thus, because dubbing is so heavily preferred, even more of the word and cadence-based humor is lost. A uh, very random side note here, I'm such a big proponent of subtitles over dubbing that I literally wrote the Urban Dictionary entry on subs not dubs. This adds absolutely nothing to the video, I just wanted to share one of my greatest accomplishments. Now Alex, you say, we've got to see the baby is such a tiny example. Just because one line is different and the humor is lost doesn't mean the whole series is doomed. Well, yes, but since Seinfeld is so heavily based on word-based humor, this happens all the time, and all of it takes a hit. Take the these pretzels are making me thirsty phrase from the season three episode, The Alternate Side. And I'm sitting there with Woody, and uh, I say, I turn to him and I go, uh, boy, these pretzels are making me thirsty. <laughs> is that how you're gonna say it? No, no, I'm working on it. Do it like this. These pretzels are making me thirsty. <laughs> These pretzels are making me thirsty. No, no, see, that's no good. See, you don't know how to act. <laughs> These pretzels 
I'm making me thirsty! Once again, there's nothing that funny about the meaning behind these pretzels are making me thirsty. What's funny is the nature of the words and how each character says it. These pretzels are making me thirsty! These pretzels are making me thirsty. <laughs> these pretzels are making me thirsty. These pretzels are making me thirsty. And that's just kind of lost in translation, as they say. However, things do sometimes work out. In the season three episode, The Library, George Costanza's gym teacher calls him Can't Stand Ya. Can't stand ya! Mr. This one's tricky, because you gotta find a word or an amalgamation of words that sounds like Costanza, but is also an insult. In the German version, it was translated to Constanza, which does sound like Costanza and is a German insult. At this point in the video, it's probably a good idea to explore what made Seinfeld so unique and so great. What is the show about nothing really about? I think I can sum up the show for you with one word. Nothing. <laughs> nothing? Nothing. What does that mean? <laughs> the show is about nothing. Seinfeld was so revolutionary because it would pick a mundane aspect of our social life and put it front and center. But nothing happens on the show. It's just like life. Whether it was close talking, exclamation points, the speed dial, or re-gifting, a term actually created by Seinfeld, a minute aspect of human life that wasn't usually actively discussed in society was picked, and yada yada yada, we have a Seinfeld episode. At least, that's what we think. This is Elke Van Castle, author of Getting the Joke Even If It's About Nothing, Seinfeld from a European Perspective. It's one of the many essays in this phenomenal book, Seinfeld Master of Its Domain, Revisiting Television's Greatest Sitcom. She asked both American and Dutch participants in a focus group what they thought of Seinfeld's plots. Seinfeld is a show about reality, said one of the American participants. The show, she pointed out, is about nothing in particular, but it's everything about what we deal with every day. As another of the American participants pointed out, the show's humor is about the little things people never talk about but everybody knows knows about, and the tacit assumptions about the way people are supposed to act. While American participants stress the recognition of trivial everyday annoyances and situations, breaches of social etiquette, and dating rules portrayed on the show, Dutch participants emphasize that on Seinfeld everything is blown out of proportion and the humor is over the top. How can two groups of people watch the same thing and come away with different interpretations? The answer? Relatability. Americans love Seinfeld because they talk about American social issues, while Europeans say it merely reminds them of Americans they know, which doesn't really spur the the same passion for and enjoyment of a show as personally relating to it does. An American participant pointed out that a lot of the jokes are about American culture, giving the example of Jerry's opening stand-up bit in The Wife, in which he talks about how Americans fervently obey dry-cleaning tags but not pay attention to government warnings. The only warning label people really respect is dry-clean only. You know what I mean? Speed limits, lung cancer, cigarette warnings. Your very life is at stake. People go, ah, the hell with it. But dry clean only, oh, don't put that in the wash. It's dry clean only, are you crazy? Another American participant pointed out that Seinfeld is a lot about the American character. I really believe that humor is indicative of social values, what we perceive as funny, and what we perceive as being immoral. This is the second problem with translating Seinfeld. The subject matter discussed on Seinfeld is so largely centered around American culture, customs, and etiquette that it doesn't really translate to other countries. While pretty much all sitcoms have pop culture references, they're usually rooted in universal concepts, like family or romantic love, which transcend geographic location. Seinfeld, the show about nothing, is based on none of that. It instead finds itself rooted in commentary on American social customs, something that doesn't translate super well at all. While Seinfeld is overflowing with examples I could use to support this point, my personal favorite is songs the characters casually sing. Take, for example, the season three episode, The Note. I just saw Joe DiMaggio and Dinky Donuts. <laughs> You know, I, I looked in there, and there he was having coffee and a donut. Joe DiMaggio in Dinky Donuts? Yes. <laughs> Joe DiMaggio. Kramer claims he saw Joe DiMaggio, a baseball player for the New York Yankees, in a donut shop, and then goes on to claim that he was very focused and calculating when eating and dunking his donuts. The guy is so focused, you see, he can just black out anything that's going on around him. You see, that's how he played baseball. He dunks like he hits. Kramer ends up in the middle of a completely different conversation about how one of their acquaintances is under investigation for insurance fraud, singing the song Jolt and Joe. Just a man and not a freak, Jolt and Joe DiMaggio. Go, go Joe. This doesn't translate. Not only does the actual sound of the words not translate, go Joe, but think about all of the cultural knowledge you have to have to fully understand that. You gotta know about Joe DiMaggio, baseball, the Yankees, and it wouldn't hurt to have heard the song Jolt and Joe before, which they play the original version of over the credits of that episode. This whole situation would be like an American watching a sitcom about a dude who talks about a famous cricket player and how he eats a certain food, and then starts randomly singing a song about him. Maybe it would still be funny, but certainly not as funny to the American than to someone 
someone from the original country. Want an even harder song to translate? Because yes, this isn't the only example of singing and American culture being fused in Seinfeld. In the season 8 episode The Susie, George is trying to avoid his girlfriend because he heard she wants to break up with him. And quote, if she can't find me, she can't break up with me. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great show. Anyways, in that process, he lets all of his incoming calls go to voicemail, and we can hear his answering machine message. Believe it or not, George isn't at home. Please leave a message at the beep. I must be out before I pick up the phone. Where could I be? <laughs> Believe it or not, I'm not home. If you didn't catch that, that was George adapting the theme song of the show The Greatest American Hero to his voicemail message. If you're curious, the original theme song from that show that George sampled in his production is playing in the background right now. This was a tricky translation. Not only did you have to translate the vibe of the song, George's lackluster singing humorously and awkwardly plastered on top of this theme song, you also had to trust that the audience would know The Greatest American Hero, because if they didn't, it would just be George singing to some song. Here's the German version. Ob sie's glauben oder nicht, George ist nicht zu Hause, bitte sprechen Sie gleich nach dem Piep. Ich muss wohl weg sein, sonst wird ich herangehen. Wo halte ich mich wohl auf? Glaub dies oder nicht, ich bin nicht da doesn't really have the same effect. For a more prevalent and systematic example of cultural differences, we can look towards the concept of dating. When Elke Van Castle asked the Dutch focus group about dating in Seinfeld, many were straight up confused. You know how Jerry basically has a new girlfriend in every episode of Seinfeld? Dutch viewers didn't get that. They said casual relationships like that don't really happen in the Netherlands. Heck, there's no direct translation of the word dating in Dutch. Ultimately, the problem with translating Seinfeld is that it did something so revolutionarily American, it just doesn't work as well in other places. Is Seinfeld a thing in your country, or is it as big as it seems to be in America? Let me know in the comments down below, I'm really interested. Is all hope lost for Seinfeld? No, not at all. The impact it's made on culture is undeniable, and it's still incredibly popular. Back in 2015, Hulu reportedly paid $160 million, or about $875,000 per episode, to put Seinfeld on its streaming service, and a new generation is getting hooked on this game-changing sitcom. This, this should be the show, this is the show. What? This, just talk. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> if you're going to create a show about nothing, you better have a stunning website to go along with it. And the best way to create a website is with Squarespace. Alex Nickel here for Squarespace. To show you the power of Squarespace, I saw this boat in half. I put one half in this video and one half on my Squarespace website, which you can totally click the eye to check out. Not having a website can do major damage. Having a website is absolutely crucial if you want to showcase your work, sell a product, or have a hub for your online presence. That means Squarespace is perfect for YouTubers, artists, gamers, or literally anyone. And, and I'm pretty sure you fall into one of those categories. Don't, don't ask me how I know, it's just I'm... Um, I'm psych- it's psychic. Squarespace keeps working, even in the toughest conditions. There's never anything you need to patch or upgrade. Plus, you can do the whole thing without any coding knowledge. Or with coding knowledge. If you want to add your own HTML or CSS or JavaScript, you can do that too! Uh, but in all seriousness, trying out Squarespace really does help out technicality. So if you want to do that and make your state-of-the-art website today, go to squarespace.com slash technicality and start your completely free trial right now. No credit card required. Plus, when you fall in love with your website, you can use the code technicality for 10% off. Thanks, y'all. If you like this video, Video, it really helps if you gently click that like button. No need to smash. No need to smash. Don't want to break your phone and or any other device you're watching this on. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already and click the other videos on screen right now. Thanks to all of my patrons over at patreon.com slash technicality, especially these awesome people for the secret code this episode. The number is one and the word is I'm. Thanks for watching DFTBA and explore on. What was that? That was a, that was a weird hand motion. Thanks for watching, guys.